Satisfied. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Scotland Bill Committee. Scotland Bill. We begin with Amendment 128, with which it will be convenient to debate Amendments 112 and 48 to Clause 19, that Clause 19 stand part of the Bill, Amendments 115, 49 and 50 to Clause 20, that Clause 20 stand part of the Bill, Amendment 12 to Clause 21, that Clause 21 stand part of the Bill, Amendments 129, 116, 13 and 132 to Clause 22, that Clause 22 stand part of the Bill, Amendments 8, 117, 111, 131 to Clause 23, that Clause 23 stand part of the Bill, and new Clause 31. Ian Murray to move Amendment 128. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms Ingalls. And as we are competing this afternoon with the BBC's coverage of Wimbledon, I hope we don't damage their ra- ratings as Andy Murray uh, kicks off the uh, tournament. And of course, everyone in the House will wish Andy Murray well, not just for today's match, but for the rest of the tournament. And we do apologise in advance if nobody's watching his tennis match today, but indeed our, our eyes are focused on uh, this particular uh, chamber. It's a privilege to speak on the welfare provisions within this bill and to move, as you've said, uh, Ms Ingalls, Amendments 1 to 8. Uh, 112, 48, 49, 50, 12, 8 and 111, and the very important new clause 31, in my name and those of my honourable friends. And I hope that um, I, I, I did say braying mob, but there's slightly less of them here uh, this afternoon than there was here last night, will not implode when I start off with a complimentary uh, comment by saying that we will be supporting SNP amendments uh, 115 and 131 uh, that we have added uh, into our uh, – I have added my name to those amendments uh, as well. This section of the bill devolves to the Scottish Parliament new and substantial powers over welfare, transferring £2.5 billion of welfare responsibility to the Scottish Parliament. As with our previous debates, this is a real opportunity for Scotland. Today, we could pass amendments that fundamentally transform the relationship the Scottish Parliament has with the welfare system, and it would then be up to the Scottish Government of the day to design a system that they want, uh, that the Scottish people have voted for, and find the resources to pay for that particular system. And as much as the the party beside me have been desperate to be disappointed by this bill. Their approach to this welfare section of the bill has been broadly similar to that of Labour's. I think that the only major difference arises from the SNP amendments that devolve national uh, insurance. And again, as I said yesterday, and was perhaps lost in some of the uh, marae of debate yesterday uh, from this dispatch box, this is a perfectly legitimate amendment for a party that believes in independence, but we disagree with that uh, fundamental principle. We believe in a strong Scottish Parliament within the UK uh, as the party of, of devolution, a party of devolution that passionately believes that it is in the best interest of all Scots uh, and the rest of the United Kingdom to have the pooling and sharing of resources, redistributing wealth from the haves uh, to the haves nots. And the Conservatives believe in the redistribution of wealth from the nots uh, to the haves. Since 2010, we have seen a sustained attack on the most vulnerable in this House. It was not the poorest and most vulnerable that caused the worldwide recession, but the reckless gambling in the financial markets. That crisis led to an income crisis from government, which has subsequently led to a government obsessed with austerity that has choked off demand in the economy and led to hitting the poorest hardest right across uh, the United Kingdom. There are many examples, but this most pernicious, unfair and unequal of those welfare changes must have been, Mrs Engels, the bedroom tax. It hit the most vulnerable very hard for very little savings on the welfare budget. And now we have the £12 billion of unfunded welfare cuts announced at the general election, with no detail whatsoever of where those cuts would fall. The problem with the Government is they fail to see that there are underlying problems that are not being dealt with in the welfare system. For example, a lack of affordable and social housing, increasing the housing benefit bill, and many are forced into the much more expensive private rented sector, and I see that uh, every single day in my constituency. I am happy to give away to the, the, the Honourable Gentleman. Thank you, Mr. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. There were reports in the press that uh, both the parties opposite proposed to pay higher welfare bills in higher welfare payments in Scotland, which this bill would allow them to do. Does, my, uh, does the Honourable Member agree with me that actually both parties opposite should spell out which taxes hard-working Scottish people have to pay to fund those commitments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
number of proposals with regards to this bill, what we'd like to see happen, like devolving housing benefit, which will come on to this afternoon, which we think should be reinvested where possible into the building of social and affordable housing, which ultimately uh, brings down the housing benefit bill. But I think what the honourable gentleman tends to forget is that if you invest uh, in the fundamental underlying problems with the system, you can bring the benefit bill down. So getting people into work, higher pay and social housing, getting people out of the more expensive private rented sector makes a huge difference to that benefit bill. And if you have then uh, more money available, you can reinvest that in t- into the system. And I think that's why our double devolution proposals of getting particularly the work programme, the work choice programme and access to work, which again will come on to later this afternoon, uh, into the hands of local authorities who are best uh, positioned to be able to deliver those kind of programmes, allows you to reinvest uh, into the system. So there's some fundamental uh, underlying problems. And for the uh, party opposite merely to see that resolving those problems is to cut the bill rather than dealing with those underlying problems shows why the benefit bill has actually been going up despite all the changes that the current government have made in the last uh, parliament. But let uh, us be completely clear from the dispatch box at the start of this debate that it is only the Labour Party that are the true guardians of the UK welfare system for supporting the most vulnerable uh, to pensioners against the Conservative cuts that will hit working people the hardest and an SNP group determined to break it up without any idea uh, of the consequences. And that is why this bill is so important. And if it is passed in its current form, according to the House of Commons Library, the Scottish Parliament will be responsible for 62% of all public expenditure. And if our new clause, which we will discuss later to devolve housing benefit, is passed, that figure will rise to 65%. But that is within the integrity of the UK welfare system. I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman first. No, I'm I'm grateful, Tim. I just didn't want him, because I know he's a reasonable man, to get too carried away with this narrative of how beastly the Conservatives have been to the poorest people. In my constituency of Gloucester, there was no new social housing built at all under the 13 years that we had a Labour MP. We have now got 100 new social houses started. Would he not agree with me that the narrative that he's putting forward is precisely the one which he tried, his party tried, and failed during the general election? It is time to look at welfare in a completely different light. Well, that may be the the experience of the Honourable Gentleman's um, surgeries on a Friday and Saturday, but it's not the reality of certainly my uh, constituents, many disabled people, and indeed all of the disability and voluntary sector organisations who have contributed uh, to these particular sections of the Bill have said something completely contrary to what the Honourable Gentleman has said. So that might be the experience in his own uh, backyard, but it's certainly not in the experience that I've uh, ex- uh, been seeing in my own constituency, in the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations, the Child Poverty Action Group, Enable, all the disabled uh, charities, Shelter, Shelter Scotland, have said things that are completely contrary to what the Honourable Gentleman has said. And the, the, the lowest house building since the 1920s, I don't think, is something to be proud of, and we should be doing something about it across this, across this house. Uh, I'm happy to, I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman here, who was first. Very, very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. His, his preamble was, I thought, slightly depressing, because it failed to, realize, to wake up to a fact which I thought the Labour front bench had woken up to, that all the warm words about welfare and the intention that his party might have come to nothing if it's not underpinned by a strong economy. I don't think the Honourable Gentleman was listening to my opening preamble, as he puts it, because what I did say was about the underlying principles of the problem in the welfare system, and the underlying principles are a lack of affordable and social housing, pushing people into the more expensive private rented sector, which pushes up the housing benefit bill, a lack of higher pay, which pushes up the benefit bill, and a lack of skills and opportunity to progress in the workplace and productivity which pushes up the welfare bill. and Indeed, the business secretary, uh, in the very first answer to business questions earlier this morning, said that the UK had a problem with productivity that had to be resolved. So if we can resolve those three underlying problems in the welfare system, we may be in with a fighting chance of doing two things, making life better for people in this country, but also bringing the welfare bill down. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend, but isn't the issue here that uh, what he's uh, proposing is that the uh, baseline will always be the UK welfare system, uh, but the that by lifting some of the restrictions that the government's own uh, proposals in the bill uh, would place on the Scottish Parliament would allow the Scottish Parliament to build on top of those. Well, that's what I'll come on to. Um, indeed, the new clause 31, which is a component of my contribution later on, essentially says that the Scottish Parliament, a, 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 a new clause, incidentally, that we've co-signed the SNP have signed uh, our new clause uh, 31, but would give the Scottish Parliament full power 
to introduce new benefits in all devolved areas, but also top up any benefits in reserved areas. Now, that seems to me to be a principle that, if anyone wishes to put a manifesto together at a Scottish parliamentary election, would a uh, have to determine what they would do in terms of the welfare system, and of course, consequently, would have to pay for that. But the important principle here is that the integrity of the UK welfare state stays in place, and the Scottish Parliament, as an autonomous and powerful Parliament, would be able to then make its own decisions uh, to reflect the interests of the Scottish people. And that's uh, an important principle of our new clause. Uh, that I will come on to later. But, uh, Ms Engels, let me take a, make a little bit uh, of process. Um, the exact uh, amount of money that is spent and who spends it is not really the key concern of this particular bill. This is about ensuring that powers are exercised where they most benefit the people of Scotland. The Labour Party was the architect of the welfare state, the system of social insurance which covers every citizen regardless of income, from cradle to grave, and which is perhaps one of our greatest achievements and the purest expression of our common values and shared purpose. And as the architects of the modern welfare state, the Labour Party will do everything we can to ensure that it serves the needs of the people, not just across the UK, but crucially in terms of this bill in Scotland. And that is why we have sought to be the driving force in this section of the bill, tabling a total of 21 amendments and new clauses, more than any other party, to ensure that the Smith Agreement is not just delivered, as we have said consistently, uh, in spirit uh, and in substance, but also goes much further in terms of those welfare uh, provisions. Each and every one of those amendments has a purpose to improve the lives of families in Scotland whilst maintaining the fundamental principles of the underpinning of the UK welfare state. And can I take this opportunity, Ms Engels, at the, to, to thank all the charities and voluntary sector organisations from across Scotland who have assisted me in this task. They do a valuable work day to day with those most in need and we should be thanking them every single day for what they achieve because without them society would not operate in Scotland and across the UK. So simply we should all in this House say thank you to them. I am glad that the Scottish National Party has seen fit to support a number of those uh, amendments. We will work very closely together in making sure we can deliver these. And in the same spirit of inter-party cooperation and consensus, I have, said, uh, I have signed, as I have said already, a number of their uh, amendments as well that attempts to improve the bill. Although this is a very fairly technical exercise and welfare is hugely complicated, I want to be clear that fundamentally our amendments will ensure that the Scottish Parliament has the unrestricted power, the unrestricted power to create any new benefits in areas that are are devolved, as I have said in response to my honourable friend, in addition to the guarantees of the UK benefits uh, and pension system and the power to top up any benefits that remain reserved to this Parliament. This wide-ranging power effectively gives the Scottish Parliament the power to design their own welfare system in its entirety. However, unlike others, we are determined to ensure the welfare state remains an integ integrated UK-wide system of social security to allow for the continued pooling and sharing of risks and pooling and sharing of resources. We will also actively pursue our policy of double devolution by devolving as many powers as possible to local communities where they are best fitted so they can be tailored to local needs and circumstance, starting with the work programme, work choice and access to work that we will debate in further parts of this Bill. Subsidiarity should be at the heart of the Scottish Parliament to ensure that the public are engaged and are in a full, uh, the full community spirit of designing the systems that are best for those community needs. And before I speak to Labour's specific amendments, I would like to place on record uh, my disappointment at the comments made by the uh, member for Dundee East yesterday during yesterday's debate, when the Honourable Member described the proposals in the Smith Agreement as miserable. I think that is quite wrong in the context of this bill, and we should be really using this bill as an opportunity to improve uh, on the provisions that are in front of us to try and use this opportunity to make the system better in Scotland. And I hope in the context of what the Secretary of State has been consistently saying across the passage of this bill, that he will look at sensible amendments to look to improve the bill, but that he will do that both in substance and in spirit. Uh, and many of the provisions that we have put down in amendments in this part of the bill in terms of the welfare section, we would hope that he would see them as being um, worthwhile, but also uh, in the spirit of cooperation uh, of trying to make the bill better rather than trying to make um, political uh, points at this point uh, of the bill. Uh, Ms Engels, clauses 19 to 23 of the Bill concern the devolution to the Scottish Parliament of a number of welfare benefits, including power over disability benefits, industrial injuries allowances and carers allowance, the power to introduce top-up payments for people receiving reserve benefits, control over discretionary housing payments and the power to introduce new discretionary payments to help alleviate short-term need. The powers within these clauses are extensive, but there are a number of areas in which I believe they fall short, particularly in limiting the scope of the Scottish Parliament to make discretionary payments and create new benefits. 
Paragraph 51 of the Smith Commission states that the Scottish Parliament will have, and I quote, complete autonomy in determining the structure and value of the devolved benefits or any new benefits or services that might replace them. As I have said, we are committed, wherever possible, to abiding by the spirit as well as the letter of the Smith Commission, and we believe that the term discretionary, as applied in this context, should not necessarily refer to the strict definition of the recipient of a payment or the duration or frequency with which we receive that payment. As Professor Paul Spiker stated in evidence to the Scottish Parliament's Devolution Committee, and I quote, a payment is discretionary not because it is short term or individual, but because it is in the power of the delegated authority to determine whether or not the payment will be made. Uh, unquote. However, the Bill as it stands adheres to a more restrictive interpretation of what constitutes a discretionary payment. It includes a number of definitions of who can receive benefits and for how long and how often they can receive them, which would act to limit the autonomy of the Scottish Parliament in a way that, in my opinion, Smith did not intend. Our amendments seek to ensure that the Scottish Parliament will not face unnecessary restrictions in its provision of discretionary payments to carers, those with disabilities or any other applicant, both in terms of who they are paid to and how long or how often they are paid. I am grateful to him. Would he agree that, as well as being um, an unnecessary restriction in the legislation, it is also likely to give rise to dispute as to whether people fall within the ambit of what the legislation says or not, and that a wider definition that would embrace uh, more people would actually be much simpler to administer? Mm -hmm. I, I agree, and we should be removing as much ambiguity as we possibly can with regards to the Bill, because if the Scottish Parliament did wish to introduce a new benefit or a top-up benefit in terms of these categories, um, then it should be as wide as possible for them to be able to do so. Uh, and What we do not want to end up is a dispute between either two governments or, or indeed by, between recipients and the deliverer of these particular uh, benefits or services in terms of the definition of the Act. So it would be uh, good if we were able to get some clarity of what is actually meant by those clauses uh, in the Bill. Let me look, uh, if I may, uh, Ms Ingalls, at an example at disability benefit. As Inclusion Scotland has argued, the current definition of disability benefit in Clause 19 may, and I quote, restrict the autonomy of the Scottish Parliament in constructing a new disability benefit system based on empowering disabled people to lead active lives and promoting their right to independent living. Unquote. We have therefore tabled Amendment 128, which offers an alternative, broader and more flexible definition of disability benefit, which would, among other things, allow the Scottish Parliament to introduce a benefit to assist people with low-level disabilities or for those for whom the effect, the effect of their disability is largely financial. Likewise, the current definition of what constitutes a relevant carer is also, we believe, overly prescriptive. As Enable Scotland observes, and I quote, it prescribes to whom carers' benefits would be payable, stipulating that the recipient would be over 16, not in full-time education and not gainfully employed, and requiring that the cared-for person is in receipt of disability benefit, unquote. Likewise, the Scottish Parliament's Devolution for the Powers Committee, uh, but report of May 2015 on the Smith Commission proposals and the UK Government's response concluded, and I quote, The Committee is concerned that the current definition of carer in the draft cla clauses appears overly restrictive and could limit the policy discretion of future Scottish administrations in this area. The Committee therefore recommends that the clause should be redrafted to ensure that the future Scottish administrations are able to define what constitutes a carer. <coughs> I agree with both Enable Scotland and the Scottish Parliament's Devolution Committee that the clauses are currently drafted uh, leave unnecessary scope uh, in the Scottish Parliament and may limit their ability in the future to create new benefits. We have therefore tabled Amendment 48, which seeks to remove this definition from the face of the Bill in order to allow the Scottish Parliament to arrive <clears throat> at its own definition. I am pleased that the SNP has supported this amendment, and I would like to reciprocate by supporting Amendment 115, which provides for the provision of non-financial assistance in relation to benefits from maternity, funeral and heating expenses, and also Amendment 121, which inserts the additional qualifying criteria for provisions of discretionary payments and assistance by being part of a family facing exceptional financial pressure. I have to give way. That the overall approach being taken in the UK now of concentrating on tackling poverty by giving people skills, by uh, pushing, pushing the, the work obligation and also by removing barriers to employment, that that's very important that the welfare system should dovetail in with that. And of course there are provisions in here to that effect. But does he agree with me that it would be wrong if Scotland was to take a different approach and go back to a dependency culture? 
Well, I, th- I, I don't think I don't think the, pr- the purpose of our amendments is to create some kind of dependency culture. Indeed, my last sentence, as the honourable gentleman was in- seeking to intervene, um, is to accept Amendment 20, 121. Uh, in the name of the Scottish National Party members that says that payments and discretionary payments could be part of a family facing exceptional pressure and indeed the amendments to both carers and um, uh, disabled uh, qualifications and and definitions is to widen out so it does not just become uh, about supporting somebody with a financial need but indeed uh, work assistance, getting people back into work uh, and the issues around the work programme, the work choice programme and access to work schemes that are the third part of this bill that will come on to later, we'll examine some of those issues. Because I think what the uh, government have tended to forget that all of this process isn't just about forcing people off welfare, but giving them the opportunity to get back into work and supporting them through that, that process. And the more people we can do uh, in terms of supporting them back into work, particularly disabled people and people who find it incredibly difficult to access the labour market, we should be making sure the legislation is flexible enough in order to be able to do that. Point. Uh, one of the key <coughs> aims of the UK government is to ensure that work always pays better than being on benefits, and it would be a pity if any of these reforms were to alter that balance for Scotland. Does he agree with me? Well, I, I do agree with him, but I, I do find it a little bit of an irony that the honourable member from the Conservative government benches is saying that everything should be designed to encourage people into work, when in actual fact the whole design of the tax credit system was to encourage people into work, and that seems to be the first uh, aim of the Conservative government, is to to cut tax credits, which would make it less attractive uh, for people to be in work. So I think there's a very fine balance to be struck about supporting people into the workplace, supporting people in the workplace, and making sure that work always pays, and I think everyone in this House would agree with that particular principle, but cutting tax credits is not the way to make sure that work pays, unfortunately, because it will force people into a choice of whether or not it's better off to be out of work than actually uh, in work, and we need to be striving for much higher pay to reduce the welfare bill in terms of tax credits rather than cutting tax credits. We're coming at that from the wrong uh, wrong, uh, angle. Um, Ms Engels, I was talking with regards to Amendment 121 and Amendment 115. These are straightforward and common sense amendments that grant greater autonomy to the Scottish Parliament in the way it provides support to the vulnerable and those at risk uh, in Scotland. We have tabled a number of other amendments to this section of the Bill, including Amendment 112 to Clause 19, which removes the phrase short term uh, in regard to disability benefits, and Am- Amendment 111, which removes the reference to occasional financial assistance in Clause 23. Meanwhile, our amendments 12 and 13 to Clause 21 and Clause 22, respectively, would allow the provision of discretionary financial assistance in a reserved benefit. I do not believe any of these amendments are particularly controversial. Indeed, they have garnered a broad cross-section of support from charities, including Enable Scotland, Inclusion Scotland, the Disability Alliance Scotland and the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations, as well as many uh, more. I am happy to give I am very grateful. Uh, these amendments might not be controversial, but are not they actually quite an important signal? And That signal is this, that a strong, devolved Scottish Parliament should be able to determine what the benefits are for the Scottish people. Well, that's right, because the commitment that was given to the Scottish people um, in terms of the no vote at the referendum in September was that we would create one of the strongest devolved parliaments in the world. And in order to be able to do that, you have to be able to give the necessary tools for the Scottish Parliament not only to determine its own direction in welfare and a whole host of other uh, policy areas, but determine that in terms of the finances it raised to pay for that. Because what comes with that kind of financial uh, responsibility is accountability, and that's what the Scottish Parliament Parliament, according to Smith, was missing before the 2012 Act and indeed uh, the Scotland Bill that is before us today. But I think we need to be given uh, the Scottish Parliament the ability to make their own decisions. So, using terms like short term uh, and uh, discretionary uh, and on a short term basis really do not give that, that particular flexibility. And of course, it would be up to the electorate to decide if someone was putting forward a new system uh, of welfare in Scotland if A, that was what they wanted to do, and B, that was what they wanted to uh, pay for. Uh, Mrs Engels, I, I now come to arguably the most important amendment to this section, our new Clause 31, which broadens the circumstances under which the Scottish Parliament can create new benefits and brings it more into line with what I believe the Smith Agreement intended. 
It has also been co-signed by the Honourable SNP members. For that, I am very grateful. And due to its significance, we should be able to use this to transform this section of the Bill. New Clause 31 creates a new Exception 9 in Section F1 of Part 2 of Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act 1998. And I know all Honourable members would have read that and know exactly what I am referring to, which allows for the creation of any benefit not currently in existence, payable by or on behalf of the UK Minister of the Crown or otherwise a reserved benefit. In essence, this would allow the Scottish Parliament to create any any new benefit which is not in existence on the date on which the Act has passed. This, I believe, goes significantly further than what is currently on the face of the Bill. I would be grateful if the Minister was able to respond specifically to why this, in his view, would not be desirable or practicable on the face of the Bill, because it ensures that the power to create new benefits in Scotland rests with the Scottish Parliament and, therefore, the Scottish people, and that it has the flexibility and autonomy to exercise this power free from unnecessary restraint in keeping with the spirit and substance to the letter of the Smith Agreement. Of course, there will have to be joint working between both governments to ensure this is deliverable. And that brings me to an important common theme that has run through these committee debates so far, the need for both governments to work much closer together in partnership for the benefit of Scotland. I do not think we can emphasise that enough. We have to have that partnership working and that relationship uh, much more solid to make these provisions work. But let me be absolutely clear on this point so there is no ambiguity. I believe in the fundamental principle that the final say on the creation of new benefits, the type of benefit created, who it is paid to, and how long and how often it is paid should reside with the Scottish Parliament. That is my view. That is the view of the Labour Party across the United well, Kingdom. I am grateful to Honourable Frank for giving way. Just in respect of the exchange he had with the uh, honourable, right honourable gentleman opposite in terms of his explanation of the impact of government policy in cutting tax credits, and that will hit people who are actually in work more than people who are simply on yeah. benefits. Will these amendments that he's putting through, amend, many of which have the support of the Scottish National Party, will that give any extra protection to the people in Scotland against the impact of cutting tax credits that will happen in England or not? The new Clause 31 is a provision that allows the Scottish Parliament to top up any reserved benefit in the United Kingdom and create any benefit in devolved areas. So there would be an ability to create a system that allowed you to um, mitigate the, 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 the reduction in tax credits. Uh, the tax credits, in the terms of the system as I understand it, isn't a benefit. They're done through the uh, income tax uh, system. So the, the, in terms of topping up tax credits would be uh, out with the scope of this particular uh, arrangement, but there's no reason why an additional benefit couldn't be put in place for people who are in work and have children, as an example, uh, in terms of our new clause uh, 31. Um, Ms Engels, let me conclude. I'm very pleased that we have managed cross-party support for new clause 31, and if the government pass uh, this uh, particular clause, it would give the Scottish Parliament full autonomy in terms of the welfare state, which I think is what the Scottish people and the Scottish Parliament would like us to do. And I would urge, if the government are going to support any amendment uh, in any part of this bill, that new clause 31 might be the amendment that they support. And I so move all our amendments and the new clause. Yeah, 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 yeah. The question is that Amendment 128 be made. Graham Allen. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mrs Engels. It is um, an interesting debate, and there have been some wide-ranging points made on, on welfare and on benefits uh, in general. I will try to stick very precisely to the two um, detailed amendments that I put on the order paper, uh, but I can't resist the general point that I see this as Scotland pioneering many of the things that should just be commonplace throughout the Union. Mm. And I hope very much that uh, if we are successful in proposing some of these uh, amendments and progressive ideas, uh, that they will be available to everybody else in the Union. This is the Federal Parliament. This is the Parliament of all the four nations. And the success of one nation within that Union should lead to the success of all so that those who wish to do this in Wales or Northern Ireland or in parts of England uh, will have that opportunity. And I hope that we can tie this in terms of looking forward to the Local Government and Devolution Bill currently in the other place, uh, which is going to bring forward a number of proposals which will enable large parts of England, uh, many of those constituent parts actually larger than Scotland, uh, who can then, by combined authorities, 
by effective devolution, by devolution from the massive over-centralised state that we have in Whitehall, or by regionally banding together to create uh, their own uh, units, uh, can actually deploy some of those things that indeed many found commonplace before uh, 2010. I will remember the uh, uh, work programme uh, the, uh, being put forward uh, by my own city council uh, and was, that was immensely successful and then was abolished by the incoming government in 2010. I hope very much that places around the union will be able to um, use these very useful precedents of freedom and liberation at the lowest possible level, in this case at a national level or even a sub-national level, to ensure the good welfare of people in their own areas. My very detailed uh, uh, items are around my two amendments, Amendment 129 and 132. And what that does is um, there's an exception six, six in the legislation in Clause 22 that requires those receiving discretionary housing payments to also be receiving housing benefit at the same time. What Amendment 129 does is to remove that prior requirement. It removes that restriction so that those with, um, who can receive uh, uh, discretionary housing payments uh, can do so without, without having first to claim housing benefit. What this does is quite simple. It allows people in the relevant place to make a judgment of this rather than some super brain in Whitehall. So in this case it would be the Scottish Parliament who would have the chance to work out uh, their own manifesto commitments, Labour Party manifesto commitments, uh, Scottish Nationalist uh, uh, Party manifesto commitments uh, to scrap the bedroom tax. Forgive me. Uh, I think the important part of that sentence is scrapping the bedroom tax, which probably we can agree on. Uh, the Scottish National Party, I hope, uh, will agree with that. I won't uh, be sort of um, making this consensus um, uh, fragile by referring to all those uh, Scottish National Party members who voted with the Conservatives last night. Um, that, would be, that, would be, that would be doing something that's been pointed in my direction in the past. So I obviously don't want to raise that uh, sensitive issue. I think this is one of those issues, particularly on the bedroom tax, where people of goodwill throughout the House can actually rattle off examples in their own constituencies about how this has been an appalling uh, thing visited upon many of our constituents, most of whom are the most vulnerable and least able to look after themselves, uh, some with chronic disability being targeted it's uh, always the phraseology that we hear, and there's a little bit of it uh, earlier, about there's this sort of idea that people on benefits are scroungers. Uh, never do we hear about the fact that most people on benefits are pensioners who've worked most of their lives to get that pension, or are people who've suffered uh, the chronic nature of their disability and need help, as we would all expect in any civilised society to help each other. So anything, even this limited change to mitigate the worst effects of the bedroom tax, I hope will be welcomed by all those parties. Um, I will, although I must say uh, through the chair that um, if the honourable gentleman wants a debate on the broader concept of welfare, I will try to answer his questions, but I may well be called to order. But doesn't, doesn't the Honourable Gentleman agree that in his Amendment 132, as in Amendment 117 of the SNP, he's undermining the sanctions regime, which is there to ensure that taxpayers' money, paying for good advice uh, to people who are job seekers, that, that that money is properly spent and that people turn up for their appointments and that uh, the sanctions regime is there for a purpose? He's undermining it. Why is that? I, I think uh, the Honourable Gentleman may be holding his uh, amendment paper upside down because it doesn't actually say that at all. And I will now go on and explain to the Honourable Gentleman. I always help people, whether they have literacy problems or uh, they're members of the Conservative Party, to understand what my amendments mean, and I think I know what my amendment means. So Amendment 132 actually states that if you suffer financial hardship from having a benefit reduced 
or suspended, then you cannot receive the discretionary housing payment again. That's in exception 6 in clause 22, just for the honourable member. So this potentially excludes people who have been sanctioned or had their benefits suspended due to perceived non-compliance shortly with conditions attached to reserved benefit from accessing discretionary housing payments. Madam Chairman, uh, the Honourable Gentleman described me as illiterate, but he's in fact describing an undermining of the sanctions regime, which is what I put to him. Is that in order? I, I, I think that this is a point of debate, and I think we are slightly sort of veering away from, from the amendment that the Honourable Gentleman has made, um, but I think we can move on now. Thank you very much. I would wish that it was a point of debate, but it's a point of accuracy, and I'm sorry that the Honourable Gentleman can't accept when he's been inaccurate but I hope he'll forgive me for keeping pointing that out to him. I, I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. So the Honourable Member to allow me to, to speak. Just on the subject of sanctions and whether or not people should uh, suffer a further sanction because of that, does the Honourable Member agree that in circumstances such as with one constituent in my constituency where he was sanctioned for not turning up to an appointment with the DWP because his letter had been sent to the same number but a different street, and he wasn't aware of the appointment, he had that sanction. Does he agree that it's wrong to further impose a sanction after that? Yeah, yeah. I think the whole sanction regime needs a proper and thorough review and should be based on evidence of the sort that the Honourable Member brings to bear and that I can bring to bear, rather than prejudice and electoral gain, which is sadly uh, may go down well in certain leafy suburbs, but for those of us who have relatives who are pensioners or people with a disability or who represent people who are suffering because of the bedroom tax, I think we have a slightly different perspective and sadly it is one that I am trying to share with some honourable members opposite uh, with mixed degree of success. So amendment 132, um, the exception, exception 6, uses the example of, of non-compliance. But if your claim had been wrongly suspended, the point that honourable gentleman makes and which I fully support, you would be put in a worse position as you would also lose discretionary housing payments. If the rhetoric about trying to get people back into work, about making work pay, is meant, then clearly making people suffer a sort of double disbenefit goes in the face of trying to help individuals back into work. It is a catch-all, it is a broad brush, it is insensitive, and one of the best ways to tackle those problems, which we all encounter in government, is to make government as close to people as is humanly possible. In this case, my suggestion is that that should be within the province of the Scottish Parliament. In other cases, it may even be a lower tier of government uh, than the Scottish Parliament. And uh, I want to come briefly on to uh, the question about double devolution that my honourable friend raised from the front bench. But just to finish on Amendment 132, 132 would remove that section altogether and would remove that possibility. So that would give, in summary, the Scottish Parliament the ability to pay the discretionary benefit when a person cannot be paid a reserved benefit, such as housing benefit. That's relatively straightforward, and I hope uh, I've put that as succinctly as possible. Gladly give way to my old friend. Friends making uh, an incredibly important speech, and I just wanted to clarify for uh, my honourable friend the reason we haven't signed his amendment is because we had an amendment to devolve the entirety of housing benefit, which, of course, would take into account all those discretionary housing benefit uh, levels, and that's why we haven't supported his amendment purely because we have the overarching devolution amendment. No. I totally understood that, and, uh, and uh, I absolutely see why my honourable friend has done what he's done, and hopefully we'll get a broader consensus in the House as a result of that. Just one final point on what is a couple of detailed amendments, and that is this question of double devolution. Um, again, I'm not trying to tread on any sensitivities here, but as uh, an irregular uh, visitor to Scotland, but when I go to Scotland, and I was there over the weekend, I often hear uh, the phrases around local government in Scotland uh, being centralised, not, not, not on this occasion for once to Whitehall, but to Holyrood. And I hope very much that 
uh, my good friends in the Scottish National Party uh, will uh, make sure that they're clear in the debate when they come to speak in this debate that they reject a re-centralisation of power from Whitehall to Holyrood because that would fly in the face of proper devolution. Now, I know the agenda, the long-term agenda of the Scottish National Party is really not about devolution. It is about the separation of Scotland from the rest of the Union. Of course, I understand that. I, of course, I understand separation from the rest of the Union is their long-term goal. But in between that time, that time may never come, or it may come in some number of years. I don't know. None of us can predict. However, in the interim, I would ask parties of all descriptions in Scotland to put themselves at the service of the Scottish people so that the Scottish people can get the fullest possible benefit from the devolution proposals, not that those proposals merely transfer the ability to tell people what to do from Whitehall, which I resent, to a Scottish Parliament which accumulates power. Once power has been granted from the centre, fought for from the centre, then all of us who believe in devolution must also avoid the temptation of using that base which is established once power has been taken down as much as is possible, to then turn to look at people on the ground and say, I wonder what we could have from them. I wonder what we could do to tell them what to do. Just a second. And I hope very much that as I started my remarks by saying there are some wonderful precedents here for the other nations of the Union, I hope very much that all my friends of all different political complexions in Scotland will fight very strongly, as strongly as they fight for their own parliament, as strongly to push down to the local level as much as is humanly possible so that that sensitivity that I think we all agreed on about how you help people actually is done by people as intimately connected with people as is humanly possible. And I think that will be another step of progress. Before I sit down, I'll gladly give way to the Honourable Lady. Grateful to you for giving way. Uh, the Scottish National Party has always spoken of powers for a purpose. Yeah, and the yeah. reason that we're having this debate is that we were promised, as were the people of Scotland, in a run-up to the referendum, that we will have new federalism as near as home rule as possible. And that's why we're having this yeah, debate today. Yeah. And I hope yeah, you'll yeah. join me in accepting that as the position of this party and indeed what the people of Scotland can accept, we're expect we're so that we can grow our economy and bring some fairness to society, which at the hands um, of the current government, which you took to the lobbies with, in terms of joining with them for further austerity for Scotland, we want to deal with right now. I think probably unlike the Honourable Lady, I never mistake the interests of the Scottish people to be the same as the interests of the Scottish National Party. However, nonetheless, I do feel that this is one of those issues where those of us who care about devolution and believe in devolution can unite with those who ultimately believe in the separation and the breakup of the Union. Because if we all put the interests of, in this case, the Scottish people and the lessons that the Scottish people can teach the rest of the nations of the Union, we'll all be better off for it. Ali Whiteford. Thank you, Ms Engel. I rise this afternoon to move amendments 115, 116, 117 and 131, tabled in my name and the names of my colleagues on these benches, uh, and to speak in support of amendments that have been jointly tabled by Labour and SNP members, including uh, Amendment 48, which I wasn't quite sure if it was moved by the Honourable Member for Edinburgh South, uh, and in particular the new Clause 31, which was definitely moved earlier uh, by the Honourable Gentleman. All these amendments seek to strengthen the Bill's provisions in relation to the benefit system and to improve this piece of legislation by bringing it much more closely into line with the Smith Commission recommendations. We should remember that those recommendations were agreed by all five uh, main political parties in Scotland and reflect the democratic demand of our people for the power to make decisions in Scotland for Scotland. Yeah, yeah. The amendments I speak to this afternoon would ultimately improve our social security system by making sure that the provisions are tailored to our needs and circumstances and fit with our policy objectives. 
That, in turn, will enhance governance and strengthen democratic accountability in Scotland and make a real difference to the lives of our citizens. I think it's worth restating that the Smith Agreement in paragraph 49 recommended that powers should be devolved over benefits for carers, disabled people and those who are sick, namely attendance allowance, carers allowance, disability living allowance, personal independence payments, industrial injuries disablement allowance and severe disablement allowance. The Smith Agreement also recommended devolution of those benefits that currently comprise the regulated social fund, namely cold weather payments, funeral payments, Sure Start maternity grants and winter fuel payments, and also the devolution of discretionary housing payments, and proposed that new arrangements for how the motability scheme should operate in Scotland for DLA and PIT claimants should be agreed. Yeah, yeah. I-, I will give way to the Honourable Gentleman. Uh, I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady, and of course I welcome what she's saying, but on, on the, the Amendment 117, I mean, is it really right that the Scottish National Party is turning its face against conditionality, the, the focus on work in the benefits system, uh, in favour of a system where even if you don't turn up to see the adviser, you're sanctioned, you still get the benefit? I mean, how can that be right? Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman that on the very last day of the last Parliament, if he remembers, the Work and Pensions Select Committee of this House, a, a, a committee incidentally that had a majority of members on that side of the House on the committee, called for a root and branch review of the sanctions regime. Yeah, yeah. Now, the reason they did that should be self-evident to every single member of this House, because we've seen repeatedly how people, the most vulnerable people in our communities are falling foul of that sanctions regime, people with mental health, yeah. uh, problems are being disproportionately sanctioned, single parents are being disproportionately sanctioned, and members in this House who can turn up five minutes late to meetings all over this place don't lose their pay because of that. So why should the most vulnerable, the disabled people in our communities be subject to that? So I agree with the Work and Pension Select Committee, who twice in the last Parliament called for a root and branch review, and I absolutely think that in Scotland we could do so much better. I'm not going to give way to the Honourable Gentleman again, because I do want to make some progress. And I want to come back to where I left off, which was still with paragraph 51 of the Smith Agreement, which was quite explicit that the Scottish Parliament should have, and I quote, complete autonomy in determining the structure and value of the benefits of paragraph 49, or any new benefits or services which might replace them. For these benefits, it would be for the Scottish Parliament whether to agree a delivery partnership with the DWP or set up separate Scottish arrangements. So I think I do come back to the point I just made in relation to Amendment 117. Uh, These should be things for the Scottish Government to decide, to tailor policies that suit our purposes and take real cognizance of the circumstances in which we live and work. Smith was also very clear that there should be powers to create new benefits and top up benefits in reserved areas by making, as they say in paragraph 54, discretionary payments in any area of welfare without the need to obtain prior permission from the DWP. And the agreement says explicitly that any new benefits or discretionary payments introduced by the Scottish Parliament must provide additional income for a recipient and not result in an automatic offsetting reduction in their entitlement to other benefits or post-tax earnings, if in employment. (coughs) Ms Engel, when we compare these sections of the agreement to the bill before us today, we see all too clearly that it fails to live up to what was proposed. A number of the amendments before us in this group seek to rectify some of those shortcomings, and I do hope the Secretary of State will take that very seriously and accept some of the very practical measures that would substantially improve and strengthen this Bill. As it is currently worded, the Bill places restrictions on the ability of the present or future Scottish Parliaments to provide appropriate support for sick and disabled claimants and those who provide unpaid care at home for them. We have already heard this afternoon from the Honourable Member for Edinburgh South that uh, the definition of disability benefit that is in the Bill at present places limits on the types of support the Scottish Government could introduce, and therefore we would support the wider scope that Amendment 128 would give to shape policy in Scotland, for example by enabling those with long-term and temporary conditions to receive support. That is a very pragmatic but potentially far-reaching improvement. In a similar vein, Amendment 48 removes the definition 
of who can be considered a carer. And I think it's really important that the restrictions on carers allowance eligibility definitions be removed from this bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If the Scottish Government was able to vary those eligibility conditions, or indeed the <coughs> amount of a new carer's benefit in Scotland, that could allow us to do much more for the 62,000 carers in Scotland currently in receipt of carers allowance, yeah, yeah. and potentially, dependent on the will of Parliament, look at long-standing issues, such as how many hours a person can study whilst being a carer, or how much of someone's earnings are counted in determining their eligibility. Eligibility. I will give way to the honourable gentleman. I'm very grateful to the honourable lady. Isn't there an important issue here? And it's this that the Scottish people, for as long as uh, they wish to remain within the United Kingdom, have that uh, guarantee of the United Kingdom benefit system as the baseline. But through the democratic process of the ballot box, the Scottish people, if they seek to have a more generous and more compassionate welfare system north of the border, should be able to have that through the Scottish Parliament. I absolutely agree with the honourable gentleman, and I think the democratic will of the Scottish people over the last few years, uh, really from the 2011 elections and again uh, more recently, just look around this chamber, uh, are very clear that they do want an alternative to austerity and they do want a fairer social security system. I am very keen to highlight new clause 31, um, which I hope we will have an opportunity to vote on later. Uh, and, uh, indeed, I, I hope if Labour do not uh, push this to vote, then we will. Uh, it does give explicit power to create new benefits in devolved areas. It gives effect to that Smith uh, agreement recommendation, and it could be used to improve the support offered to carers. I am pleased there is a great deal of consensus on this side of the House about the need to move that forward and on uh, Amendment 48. Inclusion Scotland, who are one of the leading networks of disabled people's organisations in Scotland, has expressed support for Amendment 48, while Carers UK and Carers Scotland have said that they welcome the flexibility for the Scottish Government to define the terms of the new carers' benefit, as it provides the Scottish Government with an opportunity to improve carers' benefits in Scotland. That is why I think there is that degree of consensus on this side of the House this afternoon. Carers are understandably <coughs> concerned by the speculation about where the Chancellor's £12 billion of Social yeah, Security yeah. cuts are going to yeah, fall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we know that carers and the disabled people they support are likely to see further squeezes on their already squeezed incomes. These amendments offer an opportunity to consider alternatives. Ms Engel, in Scotland we realised some years ago that carers are integral to meeting the long-term challenges we face in delivering health and community care. Unpaid and family carers are the backbone of the community care system, and they are simply irreplaceable. They are part of the solution of meeting our social care challenges. And since the advent of devolution, the Scottish Parliament has pioneered policies that have improved support for carers and those receiving care in the community. But when carers fail to get the support that they need to continue to care, the pressures on our public services become far less manageable. It is worth pointing out that the positive policies for carers pursued in Scotland under existing devolved powers contrast very sharply with what we have seen from Westminster over recent years. Particularly over the last few years, I have met carers under increasing strain because of the failures of the work capability assessment and the implementation problems that have been with the personal independence payment regime. One of the consequences of someone losing benefit because of inadequate uh, assessment procedures is often a very big uh, knock-on financial impact on carers who find themselves having to support their relative financially as well as providing the practical care. But also, in the absence of other support, the intensity of the care they are having to pr provide is also uh, intensifying. I will give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I am very grateful to the Honourable Member. And I found a speech very illuminating, and particularly on the aspect of care, as an issue that is uh, very close to my heart and also to my constituents in Sowley Hall. However, despite the illumination, a thought has occurred to me during the Honourable Lady's address. Isn't the real agenda here to effectively turn back the clock on benefit reform, effectively ending accountability for those claiming benefits and allowing a return to rampant welfareism? which destroys communities and keeps people trapped on dependency. 
you want to turn I do think, Ms Engel, that minutes. the honourable gentleman's intervention demonstrates that he's completely <coughs> failed to understand the point that I was trying to make, yeah. which is that yeah. carers are holding up our social care system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are providers of care, not yeah. benefit recipients. They are the people who are stopping the state having to look after people who would otherwise require uh, considerably more support from the NHS and from uh, community care services. So let's not pretend that carers are somehow a drain on our resources. They are a resource which we are hugely dependent on. And let's face it, the, the support that we give to carers in no way in no way compensates for the, the care that they actually provide for free. When carers stop being able to care, Ms Engel, often because their own health has been severely compromised, our local authorities and our NHS find themselves having to make one debate at a time. Um, if the honourable members wish to intervene, then they can indicate. Thank you. Eileen Whiteford. The point I was trying to make, Ms Engel, is that when a carer's own health is compromised, that puts an enormous strain on our local authorities and our NHS. They have to make more crisis interventions, and those are more costly in human and in financial terms. So there's no doubt in my mind that we can and that we must do better for sick people, disabled people and their carers, and that with more effective devolution, we can align policy more closely with areas like health and social care that are already devolved and that are the most relevant for carers. But what this amendment, like others, really comes down to is who can be trusted to safeguard carers' interests? A Tory government with one lonely Tory Scottish MP or the Scottish Parliament who are who are democratically representative, who are accessible, who are accountable to the people they serve. A clear majority of the people of Scotland have indicated their support for substantial and meaningful delivery of those powers, as they were set out in the Smith Agreement, as have key stakeholder groups. I know that the Secretary of State takes a personal interest in the issue of support for carers, so I would urge him today to listen mm -hmm. and to accept these amendments that will move us a small step closer to what was promised and will make a big oh, difference yeah. in people's lives. Ms Engel, amendments 116 and 117 relate to the proposed powers over discretionary housing payments and other discretionary payments and the sanctions regime. Our clear view is that the proposed powers over discretionary housing payments in Clause 22 of the Scotland Bill fail to deliver the Smith Commission recommendation for autonomy because they are subject to various restrictions. As the Scottish Government said in its response to the Scottish Parliament's Devolution Committee's interim report on the Draft Scotland Bill clauses, the exclusion of the ability to make payments where the need arises from the impact of UK Government policies on conditionality and sanctions constrains the effectiveness of these powers in providing necessary support to key groups. Our amendments remove some of those constraints, including those relating to sanctions, which we have discussed already, and bring the Bill into line with the Smith recommendations in relation to when discretionary housing payments and other discretionary payments and assistance can be made. I very much welcome, uh, Ms Engel, the support from, of Labour members for Amendment 115, which enables the provision of assistance in forms other than cash for benefits related to maternity, funeral and heating expenses. That might seem quite a small thing, but I'm sure that many members will share my experience in my own constituency office of people presenting themselves in the constituency office at half past four on a Friday afternoon, facing a weekend with no money and no electricity. Yeah. Often they've spent the day battling bureaucracy yeah. and they've come to the MP as the last ditch attempt to get assistance when all else has failed. Often we can secure emergency food parcels through local church food banks or access emergency power cards, but it's precisely non-cash provision such as power cards that this amendment enables, or in the case of uh, funeral payments, when people's bank accounts can be frozen in the case of a sudden death, uh, emergency support for people who are really in a very difficult situation. Thanks to innovative technology, there are also now clever ways to deliver emergency support through mobile phones, and that's particularly useful in rural areas like mine, where there are ever fewer banks and post offices in villages, and those that there are keep ever more limited hours. If people can receive support on a mobile phone that can then be used in their local shop, it provides a lifeline to those most vulnerable and in need of emergency support. Ms Engel, I want to highlight Amendment 131, which amends Clause 23 and would extend the power of the Scottish Government to provide support in exceptional circumstance. 
This is an issue that has been raised by the Child Poverty Action Group, who point out that Exception 8 is narrowly drafted and does not include families under exceptional pressure amongst the categories of those potentially eligible for occasional financial or other assistance. This group is currently eligible for community care grants under the Interim Scottish Welfare Fund and are also eligible for predecessor social fund uh, funding administered by the DWP. Failure to reference this group in the Scotland Bill and put beyond doubt the protection of families under exceptional pressure as a priority group in their own right could put the health and well-being of some of the most vulnerable families at risk. So I very much hope again that the Secretary of State will look sympathetically at this amendment, accept it, and I look forward to his response later in the, in the debate. 